Hi, welcome back to Galatians, a City Rise series. My name is Bradley, and today we are wrapping up our series in Galatians. If you have somehow made your way to this video without seeing Galatians 1 through 5 by City Rise, go back and watch those. You might lack some of the important context needed to get through Galatians 6. If you're ready, let's jump into uh, God's Word together, starting in Galatians 6, 1, and we're going to read all the way through the end of verse 10. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Man, I love chapter 6 here and. It's, it's really beautiful, this, this opening chunk. Verse one kind of feels like it comes out of left field, though. If you're caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore him. What I mean, Paul, what are you referencing? Well, if you'll remember the last verse of chapter five, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I think that this is an important reminder from Paul that as we're running in the race that we talked about in Galatians 5, obviously some people get ahead and some people get behind, some people are in different positions, but it's not our job to, to provoke or to envy. And if those things come up, which it seems like Paul believes they will, we restore one another with gentleness. There's no reason to get over the top mad. There's, there's no reason to allow anger to, to fester and, and, and boil. No, in a spirit of gentleness, let's correct and restore one another. That is what Paul calls us to do. In verse two, it says to carry each other's burdens. This is one of the most important parts of Christian community. And hopefully you're in your community group right now and you're experiencing that. It is not our duty to run this race alone. We carry one another's burdens and that is how we fulfill the law of Christ. Verse four is, is interesting in this context. As Paul talks about bearing one another's burdens, he then drops in verse four, but let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself and not in his neighbor. I think this is a, a great reminder that even as we're carrying one another's burdens, even as, as we're checking in with one another and, and helping one another out, we have to be sure that in our lives, we're not leaning on our neighbors so much that, that, that our joy, that our faith is based on them, that our faith is our own, that the race that we're running is our own. We can still carry one another's burdens, but we also test our own actions and our own works in hopes that it's our faith that is, that is allowing us to run the race. Verse five and six is interesting. It splits after verse five in the ESV. The NIV splits after verse six, which I think is uh, conducive for a better reading. For each will have to bear his own load, but let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Yes, we bear our own load. And, and even yes, we bear one another's burdens. But verse six has an important lesson. Let the one who is taught share with the one who teaches. I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship where you are discipling someone or, or where you're teaching a small group, but it is draining. It can be really challenging to do that day in and day out. And Paul wants those of us who are taught to remember to turn around and to give to those that teach us. It, it doesn't say what we're supposed to give. It says all good things, which is incredibly vague. But I, I really think that from the generosity of our, our own hearts, we will know what we're supposed to give. Maybe it's a word of encouragement. Maybe it's something as simple as, hey, thank you. I appreciate that. And maybe maybe in the context of the church, it's it's to give monetarily or, or to give with your time as, as we're called to do as believers. But I just think that's an important reminder that those who teach are, are, are taking on an extra burden and an extra load. And those of us that get to learn from others should should give back to them that are, that are teaching us and growing us. In verses seven and eight, we get to the theme of reaping and sowing, and this is really important. The, the crux of this happens in verse eight. For the one who sows to his own flesh 
will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. This goes back to what we talked about in Galatians 5, being planted in the flesh or planted in the Spirit. A orange tree does not grow apples and an apple tree does not grow oranges. If you're sowing, which is the casting out of seeds and, and of watering and, and packing down soil, it's work. If you're sowing to the flesh, you will reap from the flesh. If you're sowing to the spirit, you reap from the spirit. Meaning if, if you give your time and your energy towards the flesh, the things that you pull out of your life will be fleshly. And if you spend time and, and energy, and if you're dedicated to the spirit, the things that you pull out into your life will be spiritual. Uh, this is a really important reminder that, that what we do we get back. What we put in, we get out. You've seen this in, in all kinds of contexts in your own life, I'm sure. One of my favorite examples is small groups, community groups. In a community group, it is really difficult to get plugged in if you're not plugging yourself in. If you're not being open and honest and vulnerable with the people around you, you're going to get very little out. It takes time to build trust. and it takes time to build relationships. It's important for us to sow into the good things so that we can reap the good things out of them. As we think more about Galatians 1 through 10, we have some questions on the screen for you and your community group to discuss.
Well, we've made it to the final chunk or final pericope of Galatians here in Galatians 6. Read with me as we start in Galatians 6, 11 and continue to the end of the book. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. One of my favorite parts of reading and teaching the Bible are the things that, that I like to say are for free. It's not really the most spiritually profound thing, but they're just fun. Galatians six eleven is one of those. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It's just fun. I mean, Paul is writing this. I'm imagining that he's he's probably a little tired because he's been writing quite a bit. He's probably a little frustrated because the Galatians are near and dear to his heart and he's just hammering the same topics and the same themes over and over for them. Look with how large of letters I am writing. I am so excited. I'm so passionate about this. It's just fun to think that Paul was was feeling emotions as he wrote this, that he was really getting into what was going on here. Again, that one's for free. It's just fun. In verse 12, we we realize something important that, that Paul leaves for us. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Basically, what Paul is saying is that there are people who are trying to lean on the law rather than on the law of Christ. And rather than realize that they're in the wrong, rather than, than deal with the fact that they've picked the wrong side. They would rather recruit you over to the losing team to make themselves feel better. This is uh, this is kind of a strange metaphor, but it almost reminds me of like a pyramid scheme. When you get into a pyramid scheme, the only way to escape is to rope someone else into it. The people that are corrupting the Christian teaching in Galatia, they have gotten roped into a losing team themselves, and they are now trying to rope in others. And Paul says, stand firm. The only reason that they are so passionate, the only reason that they're trying to convince you of these things is because they're wrong and they need you to help bail them out. I think that's a kind of a fun little realization of, of why people do the things that they do. Oftentimes, misery loves company. And in this case, it seems that the Judaizers are seeking company in their misery. Next in verse 14, Paul says, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but boasting is something that comes quite easily for me. And I love that Paul says, like the only thing I boast in is the cross of Christ. Paul has plenty of reasons to boast. He's a, he's a very powerful Pharisee. He's incredibly, incredibly knowledgeable of the Old Testament or of the Torah or the, or the Tanakh is what they would call that. Paul has plenty of reason to boast. His, I believe it's his grandfather is one of the great rabbis of the time. Like Paul has reason to boast. He has knowledge, he has prestige, he has pedigree. And he says, actually, the only thing I boast in is the cross of Christ. The fact that God loved me and died for me and was resurrected on the third day. I wish that were true of me. I wish the only thing that I was able to boast in was the cross of Christ. I know that in, in my life, in my walk, it's very easy for me to boast in the things that I'm doing and accomplishing. And this is a constant reminder to me that the most important thing in my life is the things not that I've done, but the thing that God has done for me. And that is the thing that I boast in. Part of that is that I boast in the cross of Jesus Christ, the cross by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I think we said this all the way back at the beginning of Galatians 1, but Paul is obsessed in the book of Galatians with crucifixion. It is like the single word he uses the most. And that's not really true because he uses like the and a, but like crucifixion pops up at least every handful of verses. Paul's really passionate about this idea of death in the book of Galatians. 
And, and I just love that the world has been crucified to me and I have been crucified to the world. The world is dead to me and I am dead to the world. Life is lived through Christ and for Christ. In, in the context of, of what Paul is saying here, that is what you and I are called to do. Not to live to the world or in the world or through the world, but to live in, through, for, and by Christ. Put a lot of prepositions there and I really hope you tracked with that. But our world is Christ. Uh, and then I love in verse 15, if, if you haven't gotten it yet, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but just one thing, one thing counts and it is a new creation. And I think that this is a, a really loaded, powerful term. And I think that Paul actually probably means a couple things here. I think that Paul does uh, mean new creation uh, in the context of the end times. I think Paul has that in mind. I think that Paul is thinking of what you and I would call the, the revelation. It's our last book of the Bible. I think Paul is thinking of the kingdom to come. But I also think that Paul is talking about the new creation for you and for me. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. What matters is that you are a new creation. What matters is that you have been crucified and that you have been resurrected, that you have shared in that with Christ and that you are a new creation. That is what it means to be a Christian. And that is what Paul has attempted to spell out in all six chapters of this book. What matters is for you and for me to experience the becoming of a new creation ourselves. Finally, in verse 17, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. This is a really powerful reminder about Paul's life. We talked earlier about Paul having so many reasons to boast, and we're reminded now that Paul has become incredibly persecuted. And incredibly persecuted sounds like a strange phrase, but he bears the marks of Jesus on his body. He has been physically beaten and torture. He has been imprisoned and mocked. He has been run out of town and nearly stoned. All for Jesus. Paul, who had so much, who had so many reasons to boast, found the truth of Jesus in his life and said, I I'm going to walk in this. I'm going to run this race. I'm going to become a new creation. And because of that, he now bears the marks of Jesus. He now bears the physical bruises and cuts and scars that, that come with being essentially a martyr. Paul has, on multiple occasions at this point in his life, been within an inch of death and then has escaped. He has experienced almost to the finish line what it means to be a martyr. And he says now, let no one cause me trouble. Let no one question my dedication. Let no one question my faith because I bear the marks of Christ. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't bear the marks of Jesus. I, I have never been beaten up for my faith. I have uh, never been harassed excessively for my faith, but I know some of you have. I know some of the people in my life have. I have immense respect for, for those people, for, for the missionaries abroad that, that are fighting every day to share uh, the, the truth of Jesus with those around them. This is a hard race that, that we are called to run. Paul knows that better than any of us. And for many of us bearing the marks of Jesus, getting the beatings and the torturings and the, imp the imprisonments would be reason to give up. But for Paul, it's just reason to lean in further. That is a powerful message and a powerful reminder for you and for me that when we're faced with adversity because of our faith, that it is not a reason to give up, it's a reason to go forward. As you reflect and you think on these final verses of Galatians, here are some questions to help you in your small group process.
Well, that's it. Thank you so much for joining me as we walk through Galatians as a part of a City Rise series. I have loved getting to walk through this book with you, and I hope that you've enjoyed getting to walk through this book with your community group. Let's just remember where we've come from. Back at the beginning of Galatians, Paul is, is outlining his story, how he came to faith. He, he moves into a story of his disagreement with Peter, of works and faith in the law, and then he just expands on that topic so much as he explains that we're sons and, and heirs, that we are inheritors. And he, 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 compare, he compares Sarah and Hagar, and we get to chapter five, and we get the viceless, we get the fruits of the Spirit, we get some final encouragement, we get the realization that Christ has set us free not to do evil, but to do good. In that quick recap, I hit so many of the things that happened in this book, and I missed so many more. I hope that now that you've walked through this book in your community group and, and you've walked through it with me, that now we'll be able to go back to Galatians and read it again and again and again and realize the truths that God has for you and for me about who he is and who we are. Man, Galatians is a powerful book and I love it so much. I hope that now you have a love for it and that you will continue to read it as a part of your daily walk with Christ. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this series and we'll see you in the next one.